Suze, because Suze has been taking homiletics. And she's like, I could use some help, because I know what immediately came to me when Deborah gave me the message. And for me, just for me, I don't know if y'all will relate, but it was about the enemy within. It was coming to terms with those disenfranchised aspects of myself that I want to cut away, that I want to get rid of, that I judge and I feel tremendous shame about in my life. That I, the parts of me that I don't want you to know, I want you to see this fine-looking singer up here <laughs> that sings so pretty and stuff like that. I don't, know what, I, want to, I don't want you to know about my dark side, my shadow. You know, I want you to know about the good, but what I had to come to terms with, because I also looked at the enemies, I began thinking about, I began thinking about my sweet wife, who was raised Jewish, perhaps walking with Hitler hand in hand for a couple miles, or the Hutus walking with the Tutsis. Or even me walking with he who shall not be named for a couple miles. <laughs> what part of me looks at this man and sees a reflection that I'm ashamed of, that I feel guilt about? Ugh, this. What part of this straight white male privilege that I have in my life that I wasn't even aware of that I feel ashamed of. Please forgive my people, for they know not what they have done. What part of me looks and, and, and recognizes in those that I, I think of, I thought of uh, Kelly Conway and I thought of Ann Coulter, because I mean, the, to me, the, they're, I feel a foulness. And it's not the man that I want to be, but I know that it's a reflection of how I feel fouled within my own body, within my own spirit. I think about it when I think about my perpetrator as a young boy that has so affected my sexuality and my life. It's like it's painful and it's embarrassing as a man. And I want to forgive, but I also want to look and say, where do I see myself? When I went and confronted my perpetrator at a family reunion a number of years ago, I'd been watching him all weekend. Been watching him all weekend. He was walking around with a crown royal, that purple velvet bottle, and thinking people weren't like knowing that he was drinking. And when I went and confronted him, because I'd, I'd thought about bashing his brains in with a baseball bat for years. But when I confronted him, I went to him and I felt compassion. I mean, I felt a profound sense of compassion. Because I'm, I'm a recovering alcoholic. But I know that if I drank, I could do some of the stuff that he did and does. And it's painful, and it's the shame. And I suspect that we all have those aspects of ourselves that we're trying to cut away and cut out. And I've done, I've done those exercises. You've probably done those exercises. Probably all of you have done those exercises where you go to those retreats, and it's like you write down your stuff, and then you, put it in a, you rip it up, and you put it in a paper bag, and you burn it, and it's all gone. <laughs> Praise Jesus, it's gone. And it's not gone. It's still there. I still wake up with it. I still wake up with my lust. I still wake up with my desire to drink. I go out on the road all the time, and it's like no one will know. I look. I sat, at a, sat in North Carolina last year at a bar eating dinner and looked at all those bottles, and I just thought no one will know. But I know that the filters come off. I know that the filters come off, and when the filters come off, whew, I don't want to feel that shame. 
But I want to find a way to be with that shadow aspect of myself. I want to find a way to be with that, those parts of myself that I want to disenfranchise. I want to find a way to embrace them like a little child. Because the other aspect of it is I don't have to act on those feelings. But I have to recognize them. That they are a part of who I am. It's the yin and the yang. You know, without the darkness, there can't be the light. Without the light, there can't be the darkness. It's like it's all there. It's all there. It's all there within all of us. Whether you acknowledge it or you don't acknowledge it. Whether you recognize it or you don't recognize it. Or whether you're on the journey of recognizing it. And allowing it to unfold. And forgiving yourself for the judgments that you're holding of yourself and other people. So you can live with that open heart. So I can live with that open heart. Because truly it's about me. The judgment I have of you is really truly about the judgment that I've got going on within myself. I'm just looking in the mirror. And I hate that mirror. <laughs> you know, she made, uh, Kim made the comment. It's like I felt the hair on my arms rise up. And I thought, so that's good. Because I thought she was going to say her head, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I, I kind of, I miss my hair and I make fun of it a lot and stuff like that, but I wouldn't want to have hair like he who shall be named. I just, you know, just, <laughs> I shaved my head so I didn't have to do the wraparound. <laughs> it's where I wear a hat everywhere I go because my head gets cold. You know, it just does. You know, brother knows. So, I wrote a parable this week. I've never written a parable, but it came through because part of my process of being with this topic was Susie said, well, you know, you really need to sit with this for the next couple of weeks. You need to go within and you just need to, and, 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 and out of the darkness, so much came up. Out of the rich loam of that fertile soil in the stillness, in the darkness, it was like so rich. I had one vision that, that, that came through that it was, there was, there was a, that disenfranchised, a disenfranchised aspect of myself that was in the front of me and to the left and to the right and, and behind me, you know, and they just walked. They just walked with me. And it was such a beautiful experience for us. Wow, this stuff's coming up. And I want to judge that aspect, but that's where it all comes from. It's where it all comes from. That's where every one of us came from. The light came from the dark within the womb and brought us forward. And even those that have not actually come through living or, or made that transition, it's like that light birthed up in some of you and, and didn't manifest on this plane for a reason. That we may or may not know the reason for it brings up tremendous sadness, but maybe it's the opportunity to actually feel that. So uh, this is a parable. It's called "Its Shadow." It feels very vulnerable because I don't normally do this kind of thing. But there once lived a gender-neutral, all-inclusive, ethnic, and culturally complex human. Who stood in the light of another. The light he stood in was bright, was clear and white, and was truly filled with all the colors of the rainbow. He loved this light and he would bask in it. It fed him, it kept him warm and safe, it gave him a feeling of security, it gave him confidence as it walked in the light of another. While it felt brave and confident in the light of another, it began to notice that it was constantly being followed by a shadow. It did not like the shadow. The shadow made it feel sad, and it began to feel guilty and ashamed of the shadow. It felt bad because it witnessed no shadow in another, only light. It didn't understand where the shadow came from. And it tried to avoid the shadow. It tried to hide the shadow. But it never tried to ask the shadow to go away. It avoided the shadow. But the more it focused on the shadow, the larger the shadow grew. 
the larger the shadow got, the further it got from another whose light still shone so bright, never revealing a shadow. It only witnessed its own gender-neutral, all-inclusive, ethnic, and culturally complex shadow. It got so far from another that soon it was in total darkness where it could no longer see itself or its shadow. Only darkness. And darkness spoke. Hey, you of little light. Hey, you of little light. Why have you come so deeply into the shadow and darkness alone? Very few are brave enough to venture into this shadow this deep. And it said in return, I was once in the light, and the light shone upon me like a thousand and three suns. The light warmed me, the light fed me, and made me feel safe and confident. Then one day I turned, and I began to see you. At first it was but a slight, but I became conscious of you. I became embarrassed by my shadow because I stood in the light of another who had no shadow. I fed on their light, and my shadow became my shame. So I moved further from another, ashamed of my shadow. I moved so far away, I ended up here in the darkness where I no longer could see anything, including myself. I found myself at the feet of the enemy. And the darkness replied, What an opportunity you ventured into at this moment in your life. To sit in the darkness, the seed of all that comes to be. The womb of all that births itself to its greatest next yet to be. To be conscious and aware at the same time. To begin to recognize the light you are rather than the light you've been scrambling to attain from another. It was slightly confused. And it replied, I'm confu confused. <laughs> Are you suggesting that I've been stealing the light all this time from another? The darkness only felt compassion for it. Like so many more who stood in the light of another, they thought that the manifestation of all they could see was the seed of their destiny. They had no idea that the darkness was the most fertile creative space from which all else came to be. They thought the dar darkness was to be avoided. They thought the darkness was the enemy. But out of darkness comes the light. The darkness said, walk with me. New seeds, of, new seeds germinate in the darkest of darkness. They find the inner light to begin their journey. They plant seeds in the rich soil of the darkness. They sprout like a newborn babe out of the darkness that seems to never want to end. The darkness suggested all of this to it. You are a manifestation that was burst, birthed out of a darkness. A seed of sweet soul wanting to express more of itself. Nevertheless, you can stand in the light of another or you can find the smallest point of light within and grow it from the inside out. It was in awe. It had thought the darkness its most fervent opponent and came to realize there was solace in the darkness. It began to realize the shame was shifting because it had held hands with the darkness. And it began to understand the purpose of the darkness. It befriended the darkness, and at the same time, it could feel the warmth of light indwelling, beginning to grow from the inside out. Someday, it knew the shadow would be welcome wherever it would end up in its gender-neutral, all-inclusive, ethnic, and culturally complex world. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
I've been sitting with this aspect of myself. And like I say, you know, it's like I've named all the ways that it shows up in my life. But it's this exercise of sitting with it that I have to continue to walk in and to sit with in order to be with. I've been afraid of this aspect. It talked about fear and fear and love, fear and love, fear and love. Am I in fear or am I in love? Am I in fear or am I in love? I want to be in love. But I want to be in love with me. It's like that song, I love myself so much so I can love you so much so you can love you so much so you can start loving me one more time. I love myself so much oh, oh, so I can love you so much so you can love you so much so you can start loving me. This. This is where I am in my journey. 57 years old. 15-year-old son. Been married for 16 years. We got married 11 days after 9-11. That was a celebration. <laughs> People were ready for a celebration. I'm encouraging us all to take and find a practice that works for us individually. I know what works for me, and it kind of reminds me, Reverend Michael said this a couple weeks ago. It's like if you read someone's book about how they did something in your life, you're probably not going to like it because it's the way they did it, and we have to find our own way. And I know that we find seeds of, new seeds of contemplation from people's experience, but I find it important. It was important for me to find this for myself because it was out of the darkness that this came forward. It's out of the darkness that we all come forward with the best of ourselves. Um, I wrote a song a, a number of years ago with my old band. Um, it was actually before I got to Agape. But the line in the song, there was a line in the song, how peaceful the world could be if people were at peace with themselves. How peaceful the world could be if people were at peace with themselves. How peaceful the world could be if people were at peace with themselves. So I just want to offer you, a, I want you to just repeat at me. I am willing, I am willing. to change my mind about me. I am willing to change my mind about the enemy. I am willing to change my mind. I am willing to change my mind. I am willing to be the best I came to be. Just for today, this is the best I came to be. Just for today, there's a healing going on. And I'm hoping that the choir would join me. And I know you will because you've already been paid. So, And I love that your minister's in the choir. I love Deborah Johnson. We can lose. I, I, I got to say real quick before I start this that when Deborah said it's like, well, you can come and sing and you can have my pulpit. I was like, oh. <laughs> because your, your, your senior minister is, is absolutely, a, a, she's a peer of Michael Beckwith. She's, she's just like, of all the people. Yeah. 
She walks her talk, and she's human. She has frailties, and she's brilliant. And uh, I love this community. This is definitely home for me as well as agape, just as much as agape. Oh, 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 oh. There's a healing going on. There's a healing. 